Hello, and welcome to the Spring 2021 offering of the course, Introduction to Deep Learning. I'm Anirag Katakar, one of the teaching assistants for the upcoming semester. And today I'll give a brief introduction to the topic and talk about several important course logistics and policies. Since you're enrolled in this course and or are watching this video, I'm sure that the great and growing popularity of deep learning is no surprise to you. Though the field is not new by any standards, there has been a resurgence in interest over the last decade or so. This is mainly due to the fact that with the availability of huge amounts of data coupled with great advancements in powerful compute resources, such as GPUs and DPUs, deep learning methods have quickly surpassed traditional machine learning methods and established the state of the art in several domains. As further motivation for studying this subject in greater detail, let us quickly discuss a few groundbreaking applications of deep learning. Automatic speech recognition, or ASR, is the task of converting speech data into text. This is quite a challenging task, since the same text can be spoken in several different ways depending on gender, accent, emotion, and other factors. Traditionally, machine learning applications involved building multi-stage pipelines for ASR. In 2016, Microsoft announced that they had developed successfully an end-to-end -end deep learning model for ASR that surpassed the performance of even human transcriptionists. ASR technology is widely used today, including in applications such as digital personal assistants like Siri, Cortana, and Alexa. YouTube may even be using this technology to generate captions for this very video. Another extremely useful application is translating text from one language to another. Also in 2016, Google announced that it was moving its Google Translate platform from using statistical machine translation models to neural machine translation models because of their ability to generate more accurate, fluent translations. So the next time you find yourself using Google Translate in a foreign country, I'm sure you will think back to Professor Bhikshar's upcoming lectures in this course. In the field of computer vision too, deep learning has made a huge impact. In this picture, we see an example of a model that has accurately identified the locations of several objects in the scene, thereby successfully doing image segmentation, as well as accurately predicted their labels, thereby doing image recognition. For example, in blue, we see that it has identified a bicycle in the scene. In yellow, we see that it has identified correctly several humans in the scene. As it turns out, deep learning models excel at multimodal tasks as well. Here's an example of a model that accurately generates captions for provided images. This task requires the model to understand the scene in that it must correctly identify the various objects in the scene, such as this man and his guitar in the first picture, the relationship between the objects, the man playing the guitar, and generate coherent text captions for the image. Man in black shirt is playing guitar. Here's an application of deep learning that uses a class of modules called generative models. All the people in these pictures are in fact fake. They do not exist. The model came up with these pictures and generated these pictures from scratch. If you visit thispersondoesnotexist.com, you'll be able to generate several such examples for yourself. Deep learning has become so pervasive that applications now exist in domains far beyond traditional machine learning. In biology, for example, DeepMind's AlphaFold 2, a deep learning based model, solved the 50 year old challenge of protein folding. This is a huge breakthrough with experts claiming that this will change the way we develop vaccines and drugs for future generations to come. We conclude with another multimodal application text to image synthesis, the task of feeding text captions as input to the model, which then generates relevant images from scratch. OpenAI's model DALI recently made headlines for generating very realistic looking images for even very, very vague text captions, such as an armchair in the shape of an avocado. It is so good, in fact, that it has spurred conversation on the creativity of AI and whether AI has finally achieved the same level of creativity as humans. So in conclusion, uh, deep learning has been used to solve a variety of problems from art to astronomy to healthcare and even predicting the stock markets. 
fact, the entire ecosystem around deep learning has evolved so much over the last five years that hardware manufacturers now build specialized hardware just for deep learning applications. And several software libraries and frameworks such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet have sprung up to support research, development, and deployment of deep learning models. Naturally, being well-versed in such a powerful and transformative technology is a very desirable uh, trait in the job market. The material presented in this course will be a great resource not only in helping you prepare for a variety of internship and job interviews, but also in developing a thorough understanding of deep learning concepts that enable you to use it effectively in industry or in academia. Next, let's talk about some of the objectives and the syllabus of the course. At a high level, the course will include understanding neural networks and comprehending the models that do some of the previously mentioned tasks, and maybe even build some of them in your homework assignments. You will develop familiarity with some of the terminology and jargon that gets used a lot in deep learning, and you will be able to fearlessly design, build, and train networks for various tasks. However, you will not become an expert in just one course. The concepts that this course will cover include some historical perspective on the field of deep learning, different types of neural networks and their underlying ideas, how learning takes place in neural networks, including the concepts to do with training and some practical issues that often arise when training neural networks. You will also learn about several architectures and applications and be able to identify what is the best architecture given a particular application or task. The course also tries to maintain a healthy balance between theory and implementation. On the practical side, you will develop close familiarity with training your own neural networks, implementing various neural network architectures, and implementing state-of-the-art solutions for some problems. Homework solutions in the later part of the course will involve you reading some of the current literature in deep learning and implementing that cutting edge research in order to develop solutions for your homework. Overall, the objective of the course is to set you up for further research or work in your research area or industry. The topics that this course covers include basic network formalisms like MLPs or multi-layer perceptrons, convolutional networks, recurrent networks, and Boltzmann machines. Some advanced formalisms include generative models, such as variational autoencoders or VAEs, and adversarial models, such as GANs or generative adversarial networks. You'll find that you will get a chance to implement most, uh, if not all of these, through your homeworks and your projects. Topics that the course will touch upon include in-computer vision, recognizing images, in text processing, modeling, and generating language, machine translation, sequence to sequence modeling, modeling distributions and generating data, speech recognition, and the wish list also includes reinforcement learning and games, which will be covered if time permits. There is no single textbook or required textbook for this course. A list of books that we recommend reading is already on the course webpage. Additional reading material for every lecture will also appear on the course pages, so keep an eye on those. Next, let's talk about some course logistics. If you don't already know, the instructor for this course is Professor Nick Sharaj, and he can be reached at this email address. The list of teaching assistants with email IDs is also already present on the course page, and we have TAs specifically for the Pitt campus, Kigali, and Doha campuses and several TAs present in the China and India time zones as well. We recommend that you please approach your local TA first before approaching any other TAs, although you are always free to post questions on Piazza. A list of the officers and the specific officer schedule will also be updated on the webpage very soon. Uh, the webpage can be found at deeplearning.cs.cmu.edu. The lectures for this course will be entirely online this semester and will be held over Zoom. The recordings to these will be posted on both YouTube and MediaTek. 
it's important that you view the lectures because your marks will depend on viewing the lectures. We also will monitor attendance and I'll speak more about this later. So even if you think you know the topic, uh, make sure that you attend the lectures or watch the videos. All sorts of discussions uh, to do with the course, including questions about um, training infrastructure, AWS, or specific problems with homeworks, et cetera, will all take place on Piazza. As far as compute infrastructure is concerned, every student enrolled in this course will get an Amazon coupon uh, initially for a value of $50. And once that's exhausted, you can request additional coupons up to a total of $150. Keep in mind that later homeworks and your projects will demand more compute resources than earlier homeworks and projects. So try to be conservative with how you use your compute uh, resources at the beginning of this course. There are um, marks set aside for attendance in your final grade. Our performance metrics over the last semesters show that there is a distinct correlation between attendance and the final scores that students receive in the course. We also note that there is a distinct inverse correlation between attendance and the amount of help you require on Piazza and during office hours in terms of how many questions you post uh, on Piazza and ask during office hours. So to encourage attendance, we assign one mark for attendance, 1% of your total grade for students enrolled in 11,685, 11,785 and 18,786 and 1.3333% of your total grade for 11485. Note that this is large enough to make a difference in your grade and can decide whether your grade ends up being a B or an A. We will track your lecture attendance uh, through MediaTek and through Zoom. So you must either attend the Zoom lectures in real time or watch the videos that will be uploaded to MediaTek. So if you're watching the videos on MediaTek, we can track who watched which lecture and for how long. And if you're in class, we get statistics from Zoom about your participation in in-class polls. The specific rules for lecture attendance are as follows. If you're in section A, you're expected to attend the Zoom lectures in real time. We will tag you as having attended the lecture if you're present for at least 60 minutes of the duration of the lecture. If you are in any of the other sections, that is out of time zone, you may either watch the real-time Zoom lectures or the recorded lectures, which will be uploaded on MediaTek. If viewed on MediaTek, the lectures of each week must be viewed before 8 a.m. on Monday of the following week. Otherwise, it does not count towards your attendance. At the end of the semester, we will select a random subset of 50% of the lectures and tabulate everyone's attendance. If you've attended at least 70% of these randomly chosen lectures, you get the attendance point. The lecture schedule is on the website um, and the schedule for the latter half of the semester may vary a little bit. The guest lecture schedules are fuzzy and those are to be decided. One or more of the following faculty members may decide to present uh, during one of the guest lectures. We will have a total of 13 recitations, possibly a 14th if the TAs and students are still enthusiastic after 14 grueling weeks of hard work. We will cover implementation details and basic exercises in all of these recitations. And it's very important if you wish to get the maximum out of the course. The topic list of all of these recitations is also on the course schedule. It is strongly recommended that you attend all recitations, even if you think you know everything, because we will often be going over several details of uh, the homework assignments that will help you quickly move through homework assignments, solve all of your doubts and queries about those homework assignments and get a good grade in the course. Recitations will be on every Friday of the semester and you can see the course page for exact details. Next, let's talk about the homeworks, quizzes, projects and the grading. 
The performance is evaluated based on three types of tests in this course, weekly quizzes, homeworks, and the team project. The weekly quizzes will involve 10 multiple choice questions related to topics that were covered in the lectures that week. These topics will be included on both the slides and in lecture. Weekly quizzes are released on Friday and they close on Sunday night, but these deadlines may occasionally shift according to other deadlines that may come up throughout the semester. In total, there will be 14 quizzes, one every week of the semester, and we will consider the best 12 scores uh, for grading. This is expected to account for any circumstance-based inability to work on the quizzes. So in theory, you could skip up to two. The slides often contain a lot more information than is presented in class. And the quizzes will contain questions from topics that are on the slides, but were not presented in class. The quizzes will also include topics that were covered in class, but are not present on the slides. So make sure that you review both the slides and the lecture very carefully before you attempt the quizzes. As far as the homeworks are concerned, there will be one early homework, homework zero, uh, which is already out. Uh, and four in-term homeworks. Homework zero is prep material for the course. Uh, this is intended to get you up to speed with the course infrastructure, such as Autolab uh, and Kaggle, and making sure that you are familiar with the programming packages and concepts that will keep coming up throughout the course. Again, this is to bring you up to speed before the semester so that you can hit the ground running once the semester actually begins. Homeworks one to four are actual neural net exercises and all homeworks one to four will have two parts. The part one is an auto-graded problem with deterministic solutions. This means that you must upload these solutions to Autolab and these parts will include both mandatory parts and bonus parts. The bonus questions of homeworks part ones are are intended to help you make up for missed grades elsewhere throughout the semester, but will not contribute to the actual final grading curves. Part twos of all the homeworks are open problems which are posted on Kaggle. The part ones of all the homeworks evaluate your ability to code neural nets of your own from scratch. If you implement all the mandatory and bonus questions of part ones of all homeworks, you will hopefully by the end of the semester, have all the components necessary to construct a little neural network toolkit of your own. For this course, we've named this toolkit MyTorch after the popular deep learning framework PyTorch. The homeworks are auto-graded, so be careful about following all the instructions carefully. The autograder, which is set up on Autolab, is set up with very specific versions of various software packages, and your code must conform to these restrictions. If not, the autograder will fail, uh, give you errors, and often give you even a zero score on the whole assignment. So even if your code is functional on your own computer, there is uh, no guarantee that it will work on Autolab. So always make sure that you conform to all the instructions carefully. The part twos of all the homeworks uh, test your ability to solve complex problems on real world data sets. These are open problems posted as Kaggle competitions where you get to compete with your classmates on the leaderboard. At a certain point in every assignment, we post the performance cutoffs for achieving an A, B or C grade. If you achieved the posted performance for say B, you will get at least a B grade. Your performance means some metric on the given assignment, such as your model accuracy, uh, for instance. If you make no submission, you get zero on that assignment. Actual scores are linearly interpolated between the grade cutoffs, and the interpolation curves will depend on the distribution of the scores. There are multiple deadlines for the homeworks in this course. There is a separate deadline for the auto-graded deterministic component, which is the part one. And uh, the Kaggle component also has multiple deadlines. So the part two, which is the Kaggle component, has an initial submission deadline, which uh, makes up 
5% of the marks of that homework. This is to motivate you to get started on the homework problem early and make sure that you start thinking about the homework at least. The full submission deadline is your final submission uh, deadline and you must make a submission before this deadline to be eligible for full marks. There's also a drop dead deadline. That means that you must submit by this deadline to be eligible for any marks at all. And this is the day on which the solution is released. The late policy for the homeworks is as follows. Everyone gets up to a total of seven slack days, which does not apply to the initial submission deadline. You can distribute these slack days and use them as you want across all your homeworks. But keep in mind that you become ineligible for the A plus bonus if you're using your slack days for the Kaggle competitions. Once you use up your slack days, all the subsequent late submissions will accrue a 10% penalty uh, on top of any other penalties that may already be incurred. There will be no more submissions after the drop dead deadline. On Kaggle, uh, the Kaggle leaderboards stop showing updates after the full submission deadline, but we will open up a separate competition and a separate leaderboard and we'll continue to privately accept submissions until the drop dead deadline. Please make sure to keep checking the course webpage regularly for a complete set of policies and all the updated deadlines. If you're taking 11785 or 18786, you will be required to do a course project. And 11685 students can choose to do a project instead of homework five. And more about homework five will be presented later. Projects are done by teams of students and an ideal team size is of four. You are encouraged to form your own teams and form them early. Projects are intended to exercise your ability to comprehend and implement ideas beyond those covered by homeworks. So we encourage you to pick project topics that are challenging, uh, that allow you to work on cutting edge ideas from recent papers and recent research. Uh, and really get hands-on experience in building deep learning models for problems that really have no solutions in any textbooks. Projects can range from implementing and evaluating cutting edge ideas from recent papers, like verifying results from hot published work. Uh, you can find past projects at the link provided in this slide. Researchy problems that might lead to publication if uh, completed well also make for brilliant course projects. Proposing new models, learning algorithms, techniques with proper evaluation is another option for a course project. The project teams must be formed by the first week of March. If you don't form your own teams, uh, we will form a team for you. Each team must complete the following tasks for the project throughout the semester. You must submit a project proposal by the second week of March. You must submit a midway report, uh, which is three fourths of the way through the semester and will be around the first week of April. You must submit a preliminary report a uh, full three days before the presentation due date and make a five minute presentation video of the project at the end of the semester. The project uh, can be presented by one, some, or all of the team members in the five minute video presentation. And this uh, video presentation will be evaluated by the instructors, by the TAs, and by your classmates. For this video, make sure that you explain the problem, proposed solution, and the evaluation very clearly. And although it doesn't seem like much, it is very difficult to explain an entire semester long course project in just five minutes. So make sure to allocate enough time to make the actual presentation. Uh, it's not as easy as you think. Poor presentations can significantly affect your project scores. Finally, you must also submit a final full report at the end of the semester. Uh, templates for proposals and reports will be posted. We will also post more uh, descriptive guidelines about the projects and each of these deliverables on the course webpage or on Piazza.
Each team will be assigned a mentor from among the TAs who will monitor your progress and assist you if possible throughout the semester. This semester, we're also planning on having 15 minute mandatory check-ins with the assigned TAs at least twice through the semester. This is a great opportunity for you to get feedback on your progress uh, so far and maybe even approach your TA for any help that you may need on your project. More details on project evaluations will be posted towards the end of the semester. Uh, the project is often the most fun portion of the course um, and you will learn from this project as much as you invest in it. So make sure to pick a really interesting and challenging topic that will ensure that you learn a lot from it. This is a summary of how the points uh, for your final grade are distributed across all the quizzes, assignments, and deliverables throughout the project. Note that the total here adds up to only 99, but don't forget that there is also one mark for attendance that we spoke about earlier in this uh, lecture. There is a fifth homework that is meant primarily for students in 11685. This will have the same weight as a complete 11785 or 18786 course project. Students enrolled in 11685 can choose to do either a project or homework five. 11785 and 18786 students can use homework five as a makeup for incomplete projects in the event that something doesn't work out with their project. However, um, take note that you will get scored either for your project or for homework five and not for both. Now let's talk about prep, teamwork, and mentoring, and also our policies on cheating in this course. This course is implementation heavy, and it involves a lot of coding and experimentation. You'll also be working with some large data sets. For many of you, this will be the first time that you will write this much code for a single course. The language of choice is Python, and the toolkit of choice is PyTorch. You are free to use any other languages or toolkits, but uh, take note of the fact that the TAs will not be able to support with coding in any other um, language or framework, although there is some support for TensorFlow. We hope that you've already gone through recitation zero and homework zero, as these are meant to get you up to speed uh, with the necessary background. Teamwork is important for this course, and we believe that learning happens best together, and you will often learn more from each other than you will learn from the course staff. So we strongly encourage teamwork, but there are strict rules. We encourage you to form study groups. If you do not have a study group of your own, we will form one for you. Akshat has already put up a post on Piazza, and uh, you can find the necessary Google Forms in that post to sign up for study groups. Everyone must be a part of a study group. Study groups may discuss homework problems and solutions, may discuss research papers, classwork, and the quizzes. We encourage that you set up a regular meeting time to discuss IDL work. Study groups may also go on to form project teams. So what are the caveats? What may study groups not do? There is a clear distinction between what study groups uh, are allowed to do versus what constitutes cheating. Every student must solve their quizzes by themselves. You may discuss the questions with your study groups or friends, but when you solve the quiz, you have to do it isolated and do it alone. Every student must solve every homework by themselves. You may discuss the homeworks with your friends and even help them debug their code, but when you finally solve it, every line of code uh, must be your own, except of course the libraries that have been uh, okayed by the course staff beforehand. Your solution to the homework must be your own. Plagiarizing code from the web or from your friends constitutes cheating and submitting solutions not obtained by you constitutes cheating. Instances of cheating as detected by Moss will be reported as an AIV to the university. The university has a very strict policy on academic integrity violations and expels students after two cases of AIVs. 
So please don't take a chance. If at any point you are unsure of uh, whether what you're doing constitutes cheating, please check with us. The purpose of you taking this course is to learn deep learning for yourself and not to demonstrate how well someone else understands deep learning. Also keep in mind that you're at CMU where you will often find the best peers in the world. So it will be an insult not only to yourself, but also to everything that you've stood for if you start cheating at this point. So don't, don't take that chance. If you're unsure whether something you're doing constitutes cheating, again, check with us. Every student uh, and every study group will be assigned a TA mentor. We will track your progress and reach out to you if you appear to be in trouble. If you feel you're in trouble at any point in the semester, reach out to your TA mentor and or the instructor immediately. If you feel like you're falling behind, if you feel that you're struggling in the course, if you feel pressured or unable to cope, uh, reach out to us immediately anytime through Piazza or through the emails listed on the course webpage. We will try our best to help you. We aim to make this a successful course for all of you. In our ideal world, everyone performs well enough to get an A. But this happens without lowering our standards. That is, we would like to bring you all up to a point where we believe that you deserve an A. And everything about this course is geared towards that objective. Finally, let's talk about some of the challenges of this course. This course is a lot of work. No, really, this course is a lot of work. But it has been somewhat calibrated over the last several iterations to ensure that it is doable. Over 60% of students got some flavor of A each of the past three semesters, and they completely deserved it. This course believes in mastery-based evaluation we use quizzes to test your understanding of topics covered in the lectures. And we use homeworks to teach you to implement complex networks and to optimize them to a high degree. Thus, uh, this course tests both your theoretical understanding of the subject, as well as how well you can implement those uh, theoretical concepts in practice. From my own personal experience, I can tell you that completing every homework and every quiz successfully uh, is highly rewarding in terms of the amount of learning that you take away and leaves you with a great degree of satisfaction. The target in this course is that anyone who gets an A in the course is technically ready for a deep learning job. As a final reminder, homework zero and recitation zero have already been released. So please go through these videos for recitation zero as soon as possible and complete homework zero at the earliest. These are essential for you to gain comfort with the coding required in the following homeworks. Homework one, part one also has many components intended to help you um, with the later homeworks that come up in this course. So if it seems a bit dense in the beginning, please bear with it, it's totally worth it. Homework one is also the easiest homework in this course. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them on Piazza. That's all for lecture zero. I look forward to seeing all of you in lectures, in officers, and on Piazza. And I'm sure that the coming semester will bring with it a great deal of learning, a lot of fun, and I'm sure we will have a fantastic semester ahead of us. Thank you.